Okay, welcome everyone to our next session. I'm very pleased to be here with Sandra Dedesco uh, for her session on what does climate change mean for indoor environmental quality and occupant health. I'll briefly introduce Sandra and then I'll pass the, uh, the virtual mic over to her. Uh, Sandra specializes in high performance buildings that promote occupant health and environmental sustainability. She is a PhD student and researcher in the Healthy Buildings Group at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where she combines her building design and engineering background with expertise in environmental health and exposure assessment. She has international research and consulting experience in this area and has authored multiple peer-reviewed publications on the topic. Sandra is passionate about translating scientific findings into practical applications and is involved with developing and delivering education through the University of Toronto, the Canada Green Building Council, and the International Well Building Institution. I know Sandra very well through many years of collaboration, so it's with great pleasure to hand it over to Sandra. I look forward to your session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, and thank you um, for all of you being here today. I'm really excited to talk to you about the intersection of two of my favorite topics, um, one climate change and the other indoor environmental quality and occupant health. So Mike already introduced me, but it is really nice to meet all of you. I wish we could be there in person, but I'm really happy to be virtually with you in Toronto. Um, aside from you know the, the position that Mike talked about now where I'm currently doing research in public health, um, I did want to provide a bit more context on my, I guess, professional background and try to maybe explain what I'm going to be talking um, to you about today, because I think a few things might not be so um, traditional when we think of, you know, sustainable building design and energy efficiency. Um, but probably like many of you, I got my start um, really focused in environmental sustainability and energy efficient buildings during my um, undergrad in civil engineering. And then it was really during my master's degree um, that I became interested in indoor air quality or IAQ, you might hear me refer to it as, um, and the healthy buildings movement. And then kind of between the time starting from my master's to, well, up until now, and I hope to continue into the future, um, I've been trying to combine my interests in both sustainability and um, building health, occupant well-being um, into many roles, whether it's teaching, consulting, um, or now back in research, doing a PhD in public health, um, and I'm really appreciative to learn all of these different methods in epidemiology, exposure assessment, um, all of these things that I'm hoping to bring you a bit of here today. Um, in terms of, I guess, my high level interests, they are, of course, the built environment. Um, I'm super grateful to be in the School of Public Health and learning all these great techniques. And I think it has um, further confirmed my appreciation for engineering um, and particularly sustainable building design. So I think that will always be a constant. And today I hope to bring to you Maybe some new information about the exposome. Um, it's really, I would say, like a buzzy or trendy way of talking about all of the things that you and I are exposed to every day um, and how that impacts our overall health and well being. Um, so, I focus particularly on the physical and chemical, so things like indoor air quality or chemical contaminants and exposures, um, ecosystems, so environmental exposures, um, larger kind of like city level exposures. Um, and then also, I I do learn a bit about um, social factors and lifestyle factors and how they contribute. We'll touch on a few of those, but it really is more, I'd say, the focus on the, the physical and chemical today. Uh, in terms of the discussion, it's going to start with a really brief motivation for indoor environmental quality, or IEQ. And then we're going to move into the bulk of the presentation, which are these climate change indoor environmental quality scenarios. Um, and I'm hoping to talk to you about three. I would say like a, a fairly high level. Um, we will have time for some Q&A at the end. Um, but the first scenario will be how flooding or excess indoor moisture impacts the indoor microbiome. The second, we'll look at wildfires and the impact on indoor air quality. And then the third, we'll examine heat waves, um, indoor thermal conditions, and maybe some less expected uh, occupant health outcomes that I, I hope you enjoy. And kind of the framework for today's talk um, we'll be looking at these climate shocks, so um, these kind of three, you can see my cursor, these three indoor environmental quality events. Um, and the two questions we'll look at the, these shocks through are, what are the impacts on indoor environmental quality? Uh, and the second, what does this mean for occupant health and well-being? And the main objective or the takeaway from today's talk, like I will warn you, <laughs> I feel like I'm a bit of a culprit for making things like too technical. Um, and some of the, the figures that I will have on the slides might look a bit overwhelming. 
Um, but you know, the point today, it's not like objective one, like define the indoor microbiome. Uh, it's really to instill a, a greater appreciation of and attention to um, indoor environmental quality and the impacts that that can have on occupant health, well-being, um, and various aspects of the built environment. So um, I don't, I don't expect you to take away all the nitty gritty. I just hope today is um, interesting and that it does kind of increase your your interest and attention to the indoor environment. Uh, I know acknowledgements typically go at the end of the presentation, but I wanted to do them right away just to provide context onto where all of this information is coming from. So um, a lot of this, these are studies that I've been involved with through um, many organizations, the University of Toronto, University of Texas at Austin, and now the Harvard School of Public Health and the Healthy Buildings Group. Um, and then this is not just work um, projects that I've worked on, but research that I've been exposed to with other teams here at Harvard or um, other collaborators or, or researchers at these institutions who really have taught me everything I know on this topic and I really admire. So I'm really excited to share with you some of this amazing work today. So starting things off with our first section, a very brief motivation for indoor environmental quality. Um, and today, you know, we're talking about shock proofing. Um, and so why would we care about resiliency? Well, many reasons, you know, operational continuity, structural integrity of buildings come to mind, but really the health, safety, and well-being of the people in these buildings is paramount. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this many times. This used to be the coolest, uh, catchiest phrase for indoor environmental quality that uh, the average North American spends over 90% of their time indoors. I'm sure you've already heard this today. Um, and I'm sure over the past 18 months, you appreciate that it's really closer to 100% some of the time. Um, and I think what's interesting, you know, it's kind of like seems boring when you're sitting around like here, I'm in this room by myself, it looks like a void. There's nothing really happening or so you think. Um, but really there's, there's a lot going on that you're not even aware of. Like I am shedding bacteria. Uh, there's indoor chemical reactions in the air. Uh, there's honestly, the, the glazing detailing is not great here. So there is, I'm very confident there is air intrusion and potentially moisture happening. Um, so there's just, there's a lot happening that we don't necessarily appreciate uh, most of the time because a lot of what's happening indoors is invisible. Um, and I think this misconception, um, it, it's only, I think we're starting to see now that the, the indoor environment, especially in this past year, is so important to our health and well-being. Um, this is a, a tweet that I grabbed years ago from Professor Lindsay Marr. Um, and it says, you know, the chairman of EPA's science advisory board says that federal regulations on ozone are unnecessary because most people spend more than 90% of their time indoors. So that's correct. If, if nine out of every 10 breaths happen indoors, um, should we be concerned about outdoor air or indoor air? Um, and I think even when we, we look at these scenes, these outdoor scenes of, you know, pollution and, and traveling along busy roads, um, we think of this when we think of health impacts and exposure to air pollution. And while, you know, this is a problem, we also have to worry about what is happening indoors. Um, particularly, again, nine out of every 10 breaths are happening indoors. Um, what are we being exposed to when we consider the fact that our dose is um, the combination of exposure concentration and exposure time? Um, when it is that time spent indoors, that is really what's governing our dose. Um, and what is uh, really influencing our state of health and well-being. Um, it's probably not surprising to you that, you know, air pollution exposures to contaminants have um, great physiological effects. Um, these are just a few quotes that I've grabbed from over the years that I found really compelling. Um, this one in red, this motivated a, a class project, the first one in my master's, that traveling for 20 minutes in the Northern Line through central London on the tube um, had the same effect on the lungs as smoking a cigarette. Um, and, you know, we see other uh, quotes related to attributable mortality from household air pollution um, or even, you know, uh, families with young kids always concerned about where their house is located um, in proximity to maybe power plants or other industrial point sources. But really um, burning a candle in your home is just a, a really large source of pollution that can kind of um, replicate being close to all of these point sources. In terms of um, cognitive effects, we do not only have to worry about the physiologic, but also the cognitive. Um, and so this is a study, um, one of the, the ones from my groups here at Harvard that really got me interested in joining this group in the first place uh, is where they took a group of office workers and they exposed them to different levels of indoor air quality. 
Um, so I'm just going to simplify it for, for the sake of time. But um, the gray here, this is the conventional scenario where there's been no attention to indoor air quality whatsoever. The green in the center is um, an improved scenario, so better indoor air quality. And then the green with the dots, this is green plus. Um, so this is the best level of indoor air quality out of the three scenarios. So again, I'm simplifying, but um, this is kind of the overall theme. And when they expose these workers to these different levels of indoor air quality, uh, and then put them through a series of cognitive tests to see these different, um, how they performed across these different cognitive domains. Uh, they saw improvements um, across the board from conventional to green, and then from green to green plus. Um, and this is, you know, all the way from basic activity level um, up through information seeking, breadth of approach, and strategy, these more kind of advanced um, cognitive domains. And so I think this has been a really interesting area that at least in the research world, we're seeing a lot more effort being devoted to um, to try to motivate uh, the adoption of these healthy building strategies. Um, again, not just for physiological reasons, but cognitive reasons as well. Um, and so hopefully now you are perhaps a bit more motivated. I think uh, the talks earlier have probably already motivated you, but maybe a bit more motivated to talk about indoor environmental quality, um, specifically with respect to some climate change scenarios. Uh, there is a bit of a framework I'm going to try to introduce, and this is borrowed from public health and public health borrowed it from computer science. This right here is what I'm trying to show is the most basic directed acyclic graph or DAG, if you might hear me. Um, you know, I should have an acronym police, but if you hear me say DAG, I'm just trying to refer to one of these kind of um, like framework plots. And basically, um, in, in public health, we, we take an exposure and we try to map the pathways to an outcome. And there are often many intermediate variables or mediators um, that the effects are traveling through to get from exposure to health outcome. I'm gonna try to apply it here to kind of our building science framework with a climate shock as our exposure, an occupant health and well-being parameter as our outcome. Um, and then you will see, I'm gonna bring up uh, impacts on indoor environmental quality and also what we know and what we don't know about different pathways to get there. So I, I hope this is helpful and not bogging um, you down. We'll, we'll see, <laughs> you can provide feedback after. Uh, so the first scenario that I'm going to speak to is flooding and the indoor microbiome. Uh, first of all, I wanna pause. I might spend a little more time on background in this section because I wanna provide some information on what is a microbiome. Um, and again, I'm keeping everything very simply put. If there are any microbiologists on the call, you will probably have a lot more to say about this, but. Um, a microbiome is essentially a, a collection of microorganisms in an environment. So bacteria, fungi associated with a defined space. Um, there is the human microbiome. I've sequenced mine. It's quite cool and interesting. Um, and there is also microbiology and the microbiome of the built environment. Um, and the indoor microbiome, it's comprised again of a collection of bacteria and fungi associated um, with many sources, uh, humans and pets. Uh, you know, you and I, we are actually the dominant source of bacteria indoors. So every time you enter a space, um, you just coat the surfaces with your unique microbial fingerprint. So right now I have coated my room <laughs> with the bacteria uniquely associated with me. Um, there are also other sources, um, outdoor sources, maybe from ventilation air or what I've tracked in. I take my shoes off, but still what I've tracked in from outside. Um, typically we see a strong indoor um, association with outdoor fungal communities. Um, and here at the top, uh, unfortunately, this household appears to have a mold problem. So we have some fungi and uh, perhaps mycotoxins being emitted from the mold. I know what you're probably thinking after I said that, should you be concerned? Um, and I'll start with this general answer and then I'll provide a bit of COVID context um, next. But in general, no. Um, should you be concerned about the fact that you've coated your space in your own microbes? No. Um, this was really interesting when I was involved in this microbial work um, during my master's. This was a new space to me. And my reaction at first, too, was like, ew, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. Um, but in, in general, the microbes in our built environment actually have a neutral or beneficial effect on us. Um, and it is true that every now and then you can run into uh, a microbe that, that might not be so beneficial, perhaps a pathogen. Um, and there are certain scenarios um, where that can happen. Sorry. There are certain scenarios where that can happen, but um, in general, you and I, we have our own 
immune systems that protect us from a lot of the um, potentially harmful microbes that we encounter. Um, so I think it is important to acknowledge that, you know, although microorganisms in your space might sound gross, in general, they're actually a good thing and they can promote health. Um, all buildings have them too. So your home, um, you'll probably, you know, your home is probably really strongly associated with you. Um, even office spaces, though, will have their own microbial fingerprints, and it will be composed of, you know, the people that occupy those spaces, but also building factors. And this was really interesting um, that came out of the microbial research campaign um, that I was involved with during my master's, um, where we were examining how different building factors could influence the microbial communities in these spaces. So um, here, all I'm trying to highlight is that uh, depending on the ventilation system, so if you just have mechanical um, air with recirculation versus um, natural, naturally supplied outdoor air, um, you will see shifts in the microbial community's presence. So the red is associated with the recirculation air um, and the blue is associated with the outside air. So basically they just saw shifts in the community's present. Um, again, I know I'm talking in a really interesting microbial time um, where I'm saying, you know, like, oh, indoor microbial communities, don't be concerned. Um, COVID-19 is a really, um, you know, unique scenario, and we are uh, at an elevated risk, and there is elevated concern. Um, and I do just want to acknowledge that when I'm speaking about the microbes, this is in general, of course, um, during this time with a contagious disease, um, there are special precautions we should take. Um, and I did just want to point out, um, you are interested, my talk is not focused on COVID-19. There will be a few asides just to make sure that I'm not kind of misconstruing some information I'm trying to give. But um, if you are interested in connecting more about COVID-19, um, I can point you to a few resources and I'm also happy to connect offline. This is just a screen grab of a COVID-19 risk calculator um, that does acknowledge the potential for transmission in the space. It's available on my team's website. Um, but in terms of other potential uh, risks or elevated risk scenarios, aside from COVID-19, um, we can expect to see flooding in the future. Um, I'm sure it's no surprise to you if I say, you know, we're seeing increase in precipitation events in recent years. Um, and we're also seeing, you know, in urban areas where we have less permeable surfaces, um, more challenges and more flooding from trying to deal with these increased precipitation events. Um, You've probably seen these images as well, Toronto facing floods in recent years, as well as Calgary. Um, and I wanna talk briefly, an example of Hurricane Harvey, where we had an extreme weather event um, and we were able to observe, um, you know, what did this mean for the indoor microbiome? Uh, and so a research team after Hurricane Harvey went out and took a number of samples, um, they were interested in flood water indoors, uh, in the community streets, and also in um, outdoor standing water. Um, and so they took all of these samples and even after, you know, um, remedia remediation efforts had been taken um, consistently indoors, they saw, um, you know, issues with the microbial community's presence. So um, these uh, taxa they measured here, uh, these are kind of measures for pathogenic um, potential. So, you know, potentially infectious, potentially harmful to, for, to health. Uh, and they did see them elevated indoors compared to the outdoor street water or the um, outdoor standing water. Uh, to the right, they took other proxy measures, um, you know, for total bacteria, antibiotic resistance, which is something we want to avoid, and then the microbial communities, um, I'll say like adaptivity, or their um, inclination to proliferate and advance in indoor environments. Um, and again, they saw the same pattern where the indoor samples uh, were elevated in these, you know, unideal um, metrics compared to the outdoor street water and the outdoor standing water. Um, and this is, I wanna say, this is one scenario. Um, there, there has been variability in the answers and we'll talk about why when, when different research teams have investigated this. Um, but I think it does tie into what we know and what we don't know about indoor moisture, the microbiome and health. Um, this is a summary um, by a really great researcher, Mark Mendel, who looks at this area. And he has basically tracked in the, re in the literature uh, when we have excess indoor moisture, uh, we see elevated um, respiratory issues uh, uh, across the board, many different um, types from wheeze, asthma, um, bronchitis, infections, these types of things. So one thing that we are pretty confident in is that excess indoor moisture does lead to ill health. The exact pathways uh, aren't yet clear. Um, and so it is a bit ambiguous. I'll try to explain maybe some of those limitations right now. 
Um, one is that, and this is, I think, really important for building practitioners, um, there's not really good consensus on a defined critical moisture value. And we were looking at this problem a number of years ago where there are so many different metrics of indoor moisture. Um, and here is a summary of different critical moisture values that we observed in the literature where um, it's the minimum value where mold started to grow on building materials. Uh, and you can see just this huge range in relative humidity. You often hear 60% cited as like, you know, don't go above that and you'll be safe. Um, but you can see all the way down, depending on the other conditions that influence mold growth, um, we can get down to, you know, just above, you can see my cursor, there we go, 20%. Um, and you can still get mold growth. The same if we try to take these metrics and convert to absolute humidity, accounting for some of those um, env other environmental uh, parameters. Again, we see quite a bit of variation. So um, it is complex. The factors are complex that uh, lead to mold growth. And so, um, you know, looking at RH and isolation, relative humidity, sorry, uh, isn't going to necessarily prevent mold from growing. The other consideration, and I think this one is more fun, uh, is uh, from the microbial research world. And it goes back to what I was saying about how you and I have these unique microbial fingerprints. Um, and this is from uh, Professor Jack Gilbert's lab. They did some really fascinating work where they watched um, families move in and out of dwelling units, and they were able to pretty accurately predict uh, which family was in the space when, based on the microbial samples they took. Um, so like I said, you know, your household, it has that unique microbial fingerprint associated with you. Um, they're all different. And um, based on the species, uh, the conditions in that space, you'll have different outcomes. So again, it is complex and it goes back to all the pathways that we're still trying to decipher. So um, not every pathway is so crystal clear. Um, one thing we are pretty confident in though is that excess indoor moisture does lead to ill health. And when we are faced with increasing precipitation events, intense storms, um, and increased urbanization, uh, controlling excess moisture indoors as much as possible becomes even more important. Um, and so I'm sure you know the envelope uh, discussion today will help with that really nicely because it is your first line of defense. I'm pretty worried about the glazing situation over here. Um, but we do then have you know, HVAC operation for those um, hydrothermal conditions that could lead to mold growth, the materials and products that we use in the spaces, um, so how those can have the potential to wet and dry. Um, and also too, I, I did wanna point out, um, I think with COVID, like we're all you know, at an elevated um, concern for these things. And I think uh, the temptation to use antimicrobial products is maybe a little more uh, pervasive than usual. Um, but in general, like, you know, the, the antimicrobial products do more harm than good when we're trying to avoid things like the progression of um, antibiotic resistance um, communities. So I think it is important to, to try to limit the use of that as well. Um, moving along into the next uh, in climate shock, indoor environmental quality um, scenario, we have wildfires and indoor air quality. And I think this one might be a little more tangible. I know the, the microbiome is kind of less familiar and even more invisible. So um, maybe this one will be more of interest. Um, but I, I borrowed these slides from Chris Ray's presentation to the EPA. Um, I thought it was really interesting. He was observing a wildfire um, and he uh, took measurements um, August 25th and 26th, 2015 during the wildfire um, in his office, um, in an administration building. Um, so he has all of these different indoor environments where he took these particle measures. Um, and you can see these you know, values right here might not be so meaningful, but he's contextualized them with um, like risk ratings and hazard ratings. So here we have hazardous, very unhealthy, and the outside concentration at catastrophic. Uh, just for reference, the EPA has set a 24 hour exposure threshold. Um, this is 35 micrograms per cubic meter. So um, just for context, you know, I know 405, it's like, what does that mean? It's, you know, quite elevated compared to this threshold that is set for health and welfare considerations, not so much environmental, but for human and societal health and welfare. So uh, in this wildfire event, you can see that we're just well beyond this exposure threshold set. Um, I, for one, like I was just um, speaking to uh, some of the conference organizers earlier. I, I used to live in Australia and that was my first experience with wildfires bushfires, they call them. But um, that was the first time I had to worry about it. Um, I thought, you know, oh, moving back to Toronto, like, 
not really a, a concern, but um, I was still in Toronto this past summer. And I think probably a lot of us can relate to the experience of the, the smoke wave. And um, I don't know if anyone else felt respiratory irritation from that, but um, that was, uh, again, an, an interesting uh, climate experience this summer. Um, and we can see the smoke kind of as a river just flowing through um, from these wildfires that we're again seeing in um, increasing prevalence. Uh, I'm sure the wildfires, like again, this is more tangible. I, I, I don't think I have to say, you know, like they're problematic, but it really is the, the, partic the particles um, from the wildfires that are uh, such a concern. So if we do look across the board at, you know, different air pollutants, we see that um, fine particulate matter, this PM 2.5, um, in this epidemiologic study, they found it had the highest contribution to these DALIs, these disability adjusted life years. And basically the, the DALI metric, it accounts for both years of life lost, so premature mortality, um, and also years lived with a disability. So you can think of impaired quality of life. Um, and this DALI tries to quantify both the premature mortality and the, the years of impaired life and you can see that it is the particulate matter that we are most concerned about. Um, this is also borrowed from the iconic, I say iconic, I think it really is, um, the six, six city study, I'm so excited, um, from the Harvard School of Public Health. And um, this was you know, groundbreaking research back in the early 90s, uh, where they looked at different cities, they looked at the ambient particulate matter levels, and they were able to um, you know, quantify the, for the first time, like accounting for other variables that could be influencing this effect, um, they were able to quantify the elevated risk of all-cause mortality um, and also these you know, cardiovascular and, and lung cancer um, issues in the populations. And they were able to notice this strong increase in all of these, sorry, my cursor disappears sometimes, the strong increase in all of these um, with higher ambient um, particulate matter. Again, I, I keep pulling on the cognitive effects piece as well, because I think, or at least for me, I, my mind always went to physiologic outcomes. Um, and it's the cognitive effects that have, I think, really captured my interest recently. And there's a lot of really amazing work coming out in this space, um, including just this spring. Another group here um, at Harvard, led by Joel Schwartz, um, they were looking at uh, cognitive performance um, from exposure to particulate matter. And even short-term exposure, they have observed um, negative associations with cognitive function, so impairment. Um, in terms of, you know, like remediation strategies, um, I know we just had a filtration talk, but sorry, I, I must talk about filtration as well. Um, I think, you know, your first line of defense is your media filters to filter out those particles. Um, of course, we always do see a dip um, depending on the particle size, but really this is your First line of defense, and I put the happy face in because I have noticed in the past year as I've been walking around during my COVID walks, so many more filters in the garbage, which is great because I think, you know, people are replacing them more and more. Like I never used to see such an abundance of filters in the trash, but I'm noticing not only more filters, but thicker filters indicating higher filtration efficiency. So this is really exciting. Um, but, you know, I call this an active system because you put it in the mechanical system, but really like how active are these systems? Um, and so this is some really nice research from um, my old master's group out of the University of Toronto, uh, where they're always looking to quantify um, system runtime, so the amount of time that the ventilation system is operating, and to draw your attention to the residential um, dwellings with the black circle, uh, you can see that you know on a typical day, we're not seeing um, much system runtime. Uh, it might be more straightforward with this um, chart where they're looking at all of the samples based on like different thermostats, for example. Um, and I've put this blue arrow in to show you, you know, this is 50% runtime. Um, and then this is the proportion of samples that are, you know, exceeding that 50% runtime. So all I'm trying to say is that, you know, we're seeing low runtimes, like below 50%, often lower um, in a lot of residential houses. So if you need the air, you know, if you need the system running to get the air pushed through that filter to get the filtration benefit, um, just how active is the system? Are you always getting the benefit? Um, and that's where some decoupled active strategies come in. I'm really excited about portable air cleaners. I think a lot more people are as well, just based on, you know, the fact that you're seeing them pop up from different um, product manufacturers. You're seeing them sell out in places. Um, the particle filters are really exciting because you do notice a measurable decrease in indoor particles. 
Um, and you can also see, you know, in studies that monitor health outcomes, improvements uh, in different health. This was looking at children in particular um, and improvements in asthma symptoms and reduced uh, like absences at school and whatnot. Um, again, this past year has been really interesting with the collision of these climate shocks and also the COVID-19 pandemic, um, where we've seen a lot of um, places just sell out of portable air cleaners, which, I mean, I've never, I've never seen filters and air cleaners and indoor air quality be in so much demand. Um, but there is, a, I think, a, an interesting opportunity to kind of um, get creative and, and also better prepare for, for potential future events. So um, my group did put together a do-it-yourself portable air cleaner guide if you want to build your own. I know I'm pretty excited. Uh, I built my own last weekend. Um, and these actually have great, uh, depending on the model you use, great cleaning effectiveness, low cost. Um, and when you do have a situation perhaps for um, stores run out of supplies or off the shelf units, um, this could possibly be an option um, depending on what materials are available. Uh, going along with personal strategies, I think it's um, interesting too that, I, I mean, I have way too many masks here. The, the university now provides them. I guess I didn't need to bring so many with me or buy so many. Um, but, you know, just thinking about wildfires and the potential for smoke waves, like our good friend, the N95 mask um, is, you know, recommended. Uh, the surgical masks aren't going to be sufficient. And so um, I think it's it's interesting to think about, you know, not only do you have a 72 hour supply kit, but also um, what are you going to make sure you have in them? And I don't know if it's just me and my affinity for indoor air quality, that's probably going to have some box fans and extra MERV filters lying around in addition to masks. Um, but I just found this interesting that, you know, some of the strategies for COVID that I think a lot of people are fed up with um, can be really useful for, for other reasons too. And, and I'm just curious to see how uh, mask wearing might, might last um, beyond COVID. So we'll see. Um, I did also wanna say, you know, I'm talking a lot about filtration and I feel it would be remiss of me not to mention, um, just to be cautious of certain newer technologies or miracle technologies being pushed that do you have some good benefit for some targeted um, removal strategies? But uh, a lot of these newer technologies that don't go through the, I would say like more standardized testing that the um, pleated media filters do, they can be problematic and they can introduce um, potentially harmful byproducts. So I would just say be uh, a bit mindful and, and I would recommend if you are you know, interested to, to read the open letter that I've linked below, or you can connect with me after and I can direct you to it. Um, just because this is, I think, just such a topic of conversation with COVID, um, I think it is important to just be mindful of the, the advantages and the disadvantages of some of these. And finally, I wanna get into the last section. This is uh, heat waves and indoor conditions. Um, and again, this past summer we saw um, kind of unprecedented events. We saw British Columbia set Canada's heat record, um, apologies for the Fahrenheit. Um, and we also did see that uh, there were increased deaths with a lot of victims being the elderly population. Um, there are a range of health effects from heat waves, physiological again. Um, this is, you know, it can come from fluid imbalance, uh, heat stroke directly, all of these things, but we do see noticeable increases in hospital admissions for just a whole range of health effects. In terms of the indoor environment, it's probably not going to surprise you that individuals without air conditioning will see increased temperatures indoors during a heat wave compared to individuals in these white boxes um, without, or sorry, with air conditioning. So higher indoor temperatures with no AC, not surprising. Um, and once again, you know, it's not just, you know, the heat in the, in the house that's going to have a, an effect on your health. Um, there's also degraded indoor air quality that we see from uh, increased material emissions. When, when surfaces and materials heat up, they more readily emit um, potential contaminants. Um, so there are, again, all of these pathways that we can get ill health through. Um, again, starting with the physiologic, it's probably not surprising to you that the no AC group, no air conditioning, they see their heart rate increase quite dramatically uh, days into the heat wave. But then at around day three and going into day four and onward, um, you probably see the, the heart rate decrease and you're thinking that's really weird, what's going on there? Um, don't worry, I'm not gonna dive into the slide too much. It's uh, again from Professor Joel Schwartz's group here, um, but it is this adaptation idea. And I think it's you know akin to exercising as you start to exercise and train. 
um, the exercise that you were doing that was once hard becomes less hard. Um, and basically, this is just a, a very, very complicated and great model they put together where they were able to statistically model um, the impact of adaptation strategies at a really wide, you know, um, built environment level where um, they're saying, like, if we implement these adaptive strategies to try to combat um, increased temperatures in the future, we might not see the ill health that we expect, depending on, on how that all works. But just trying to highlight that even, you know, at the city level that can happen, at the personal level, your system will adapt and perhaps um, you, you might adapt to the heat wave and the increased temperature there too. So just in case you're wondering what that is. Um, what I'm really excited to share though is the interesting, or at least I think interesting cognitive effects from these heat wave scenarios. So once again, we have the group without air conditioning with the solid line and the group with air conditioning with the dashed line. And here we've put them through um, just basic addition and subtraction tests. Uh, and you can see that um, in terms of their ability, their uh, working memory, it's reduced in the no AC group. And then their throughput, their, their kind of their speed at going through this is also reduced compared to the group with the AC. Uh, if we look at the Stroop test, um, this is a very, I've done this before when I was a participant, it's really hard. <laughs> um, but basically here, uh, they're measuring like inhibitory control. Uh, and then again, the throughput, the speed at which um, occupants are going through these tests. Um, and again, the group without AC is, um, is having lower scores in, in both of these uh, metrics of the test compared to the group with AC. Um, and all of this, you know, the researchers in um, my group put together these really cool models where they were able to see um, the dips uh, and, and the peaks in um, the performance of these different tests. And you can see there's a really strong effect with temperature when we get into the range that I think we're probably all familiar with, with around, you know, 22, 23 um, being optimal for these different uh, cognitive processes. And um, we can see these measurable improvements um, in, in the thermal conditions and the, sorry, the cognitive conditions. Um, and in terms of just thinking about, you know, how to uh, create comfortable indoor environments thermally for both physiologic and cognitive health, um, it once again is those passive systems like the envelope, the integrity and the performance of it, moving on to those active central systems um, and then decoupling. So um, actually weak air movement is often a common complaint um, and having just a fan, a really basic fan is a way to both decouple from a central system or if you don't have AC, like that's always been me in Toronto, um, the fan is your best friend for that uh, air movement and the convective cooling effect. I do want to say as well, though, you know, we talked about heat waves, but it is actually moderate cold that seems to be particularly problematic in terms of all cause mortality. Um, and I think this is interesting, too, because we often think that it's the extreme temperature, but it often is that transition period where the body is not yet adapted or the building is not yet adapted. We see that a lot in the shoulder seasons where we run into problems in adapting to changes in these conditions. So I know I talked about heat today, but just something to keep in mind. Um, and in terms of just closing, um, I wanted to leave you, you know, we talked a lot about these three different indoor environmental quality, um, health and well-being situations related to different climate shocks. Um, I hope you found it interesting. And if you have any questions, um, we'll jump into those. But there was one thing that I did, there was a bit of a theme that might have been a little not so explicit, and that is the prioritization of measure implementation. And I did just want to pause because um, I think, you know, people in the building industry and urban planning and development have a really great opportunity to target these strategies where it's needed most um, and where populations might be more vulnerable. Um, and so this is just uh, some figures from Dr. Uh, Francesca Dominica's group here where they look at policy changes. So here on the right, we have um, populations living in elevated particulate matter levels. Um, and the, the blue dots represent minority groups um, compared to the lighter situation. And when we see the enforcement of um, these ambient air quality thresholds from 2010 to 2016, um, the areas that disappeared, those are areas that lowered their ambient particulate matter levels. Um, but the areas that remain are the vulnerable populations, the minority groups that we see consistently are at um, elevated risk for death and ill health. So I think um, in architecture, we're starting to see some, I think really great uh, prominent attention to these more vulnerable populations um, and what we can do to try to make 
the built environment a healthier place for all. So thank you. I, I'm sorry, I can't see anyone, but I think I hear a mic on and I believe it is time for questions. So and that's my email. It's time. It's time, excellent. It's time. <laughs> Thanks, Sandra. Thanks. Great presentation. Um, I need more air quality coming into this room right now. That was a lot to, oh, no. to grab. <laughs> um, you can hear me okay? I can. I stopped sharing, so I can now see you too. Oh, okay. Cool. Nice yeah. to see you. Nice to see you. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, if our fresh air is coming from the outdoors, shouldn't outdoor air quality be concern number one? That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of us grapple with that because in Canada, we're um, quite fortunate to have, I would say, fairly good air quality. Um, but you do raise a really good point that, yeah, outdoor air quality is concern number one. And especially with wildfires, um, when we're trying to bring that outdoor air in um, and it's you know contaminated to those catastrophic part particle levels we saw, or even regions that don't have um, the same regulation we do over emissions, uh, outdoor air is priority number one. And so that filtration um, that we spoke about, the particle filtration, um, extra levels and even higher efficiency become more important. Um, so maybe a related question. Um, some of the in-room uh, filtration technology that you were talking about, some of those in-room HEPA filters, for example, that have become popular in COVID, can those be sized and run sufficiently to improve the air quality during uh, a forest fire event where you see those uh, elevated uh, particulate levels inside? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I didn't include a link to it here, but um, our group here at Harvard in collaboration with UC Boulder, um, they put together actually a, a portable air cleaner calculator. Um, so I can link it to anyone. Um, I guess my email was on the slide, but um, or if you Google it, uh, you can basically put different factors in related to your room, the size, um, the baseline ventilation, and it will help you determine the size of the air cleaner you need to hit um, the appropriate amount of air changes. I'm simplifying it. It's a lot more complicated, but like, yes, you, you can supplement with air cleaners to improve the air quality. Uh, depending on the size of the space and um, the contamination, it might be challenging, but um, in general, yes, short answer. That's great. Good. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'd be interested in that resource. So, uh, yeah, excellent. yeah. Um, next question. The, the connection between smoking and, and various health impacts seems to be well understood. Um, uh, I think the, the labels on the packages themselves make that clear. Um, but are, are similar cause and effects seen from people in poor uh, indoor air quality environments uh, on a regular basis, you know, for example, people that are riding the London tube every day, like are, are we seeing elevated levels of, of cancer in those populations or other indicators of poor health? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I think um, the six, six city study that I mentioned is, um, I think the best example of where they were able to account for smoking in the population, control for that, and then observe um, the impact of ambient pollution on ill health. Um, in terms of like the subway experiments, or sorry, the subway studies that I was looking at in the past, they were very exposure driven. They weren't so epidemiology driven where you were quantifying um, the outcome associated with the exposure. But um, you do see in the occupational health world, um, they look much at the, the worker population specifically and really focus on isolating the work exposures and how that leads to ill health. So um, I know that's a bit of a high level answer. We can always connect offline if you'd like, a, if we can help find a specific resource. Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, thanks so much, Sandra. I'm gonna wrap up the, the question period there. Um, Sandra is gonna be around and I think she'll be joining uh, one of the coffee uh, break sessions in the afternoon. So I imagine you could pick her brain further there or, um, I know Sandra well from over the years, and so if you reach out to her, I'm sure she'd be more than happy to, to answer, answer your questions or, or have a conversation.